you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Uh, hi, folks. It's Voss here from the ChrisVossShow.com. The Chris Voss Show. Welcome to the big show, the Big Ten in the Sky, folks. The podcast where billionaires, newsmakers, uh, CEOs, uh, the hottest authors come to talk shop and uh, sell their wares and uh, tell you about how to be smarter and better and all that good stuff so you don't grow up and be like Chris Voss. <laughs> See what I did there? Uh, we're going to be talking about some amazing things. Some of my favorite subjects, of course, as always. I wrote a book about it. Uh, leadership. We love leadership. We're also going to talk about unicorns and leadership. So uh, right now, you're probably sitting, listening to the show, going, leadership and unicorns? Unicorns and leadership? What is that about? Well, we have just the gentleman who's come on the show to tell us about it and uh, let you know that uh, unicorns evidently do exist and you can be one too. According to uh, William Vanderblumen, uh, he joins us on the show today to talk about his amazing book. Uh, November 14th, 2023, it comes out. Be the Unicorn, 12 Data-Driven Habits That Separate the Best Leaders from the rest and that makes me just want to be a unicorn and if you want to be a unicorn too by the way uh let's guilt and shame you and do referring the show to your family friends and relatives go to goodreads.com for says chris voss youtube.com for says chris voss linkedin.com for says chris voss and chris voss one on the ticky talkity or whatever those kids are doing these days uh william is the ceo and founder of vanderblumen search group a top executive search firm in his upcoming book that we aforementioned from harper collins leadership he reveals how job seekers employees hiring managers and company leaders everywhere can stand out from their peers and become irreplaceable building the careers that they've always wanted uh he's uh, been regularly retained to identify the best talent for teams manage successful planning and consulting on all issues regarding business teams and this year he's going to complete his 3000s executive search prior to founding his uh, search group he studied executive search under mentors with 25 plus years of executive search experience at the highest level his learning taught him the very best corporate practices including the search strategies used by internationally known firm russell reynolds prior to that william served as a senior pastor at one of the largest presbyterian churches in the united states and he joins us here today welcome to the show william how are you I'm great, Chris. Thanks for having me today. I've really been looking forward to our time together. I've been looking forward to as well. Am I getting your last name correct? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I, I say Vanderblumen, but I, you know, Vanderblumen. People in the motherland might say it differently. So, oh, there you go. Where is the motherland, by the way? Is that, is so that it's, our... uh, it, it'd be Dutch. Dutch. So, there you go. Yeah, there it, you go. It, it's uh, <laughs> it it down in Limburg where the really stinky ah, cheese is. Yeah, that's go. where our people were for a long, long time till they came over, right before the Civil War. There you go. There you go. Well, welcome to America, <laughs> to the Dutch, <laughs> and uh, all that good stuff. Give us your dot coms. Where do you want people to find you on the interwebs? Yeah, so it's pretty simple. Um, I I really didn't want anything named after me, but the search engine, the SEO guys, all said. After a big long study, hey, listen, uh, y y y good news, we found the right domain. Bad news, it's your name. I'm like, what? And they said, yeah, no, your last name is so screwed up that you can misspell it into Google any way you want and it'll come back to your site. So we went with that. And uh, if people are looking for me, they can sp spell Vanderblumen however they like into Google. Or I guess some people use other search engines. Uh, and same in Amazon. Just ah. however you want, and it'll pop up. And uh, it's a pretty cool site. Uh, if you're a business owner, like we spend our days helping great organizations find their top staff. And one of the ways we have tried to, to give back is to write content. So there are probably 3,500 free resources on how you can build and run oh. and keep a great team at Vanderblumen.com. 
There you go. So uh, give us a, a reason why you wrote this book and yeah. why should we want to be a unicorn? I mean, that's yeah. kind of, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a dirty old horse. Why do I want to be a unicorn? So, so two reasons. One, a longstanding question. And two, I kind of fell into this. Mm. Uh, so the first one is this question. I don't know, Chris, if you ever go to a party and you, there's somebody in the room that everyone's drawn to, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're just life of the party or, or you, you meet somebody for a coffee and within five minutes, you're like, this one's a winner. Huh? Know it. I mean, have you ever had that happen? You just know. Yeah. It. Yeah. It's usually with me alone. Um, <laughs> But there's that. So, so <laughs> I've been wondering for a long, long time, like, why is that? What's the superpower that within it? And can we figure out what it is? And is there mm -hmm. any way to learn it? Or is mm -hmm. it just sort of, sorry, it's like being able to run the 40 at a certain speed. You can't, you know, I'm not going to win the NBA slam dunk competition ever, no matter how mm -hmm. hard I train, right? Yeah. Uh, so so it's, there's this question. Why? Why do some people come off as winners right away? Well, fast forward many, many years after starting to ask that question, we had a pandemic and a lot of most businesses shut down. Mm -hmm. uh, nearly all of our clients were shut down and on hiring freezes and, you know, nobody knew what was going to happen with the world. So we, we did our own pivot and said uh, we've been careful as a financially. So this year we're going to spend our time serving our clients. And, and if we make money, fine, but serve, don't sell. You know, everybody's having a hard year. And, and in, in the rest of our time, we're going to spend working on the business and not in it, right? Mm -hmm. So back around to this question, uh, what makes these unicorn-type people unicorns? We realized that it, it, when we were during the shutdown, uh, when we do a search, maybe there are 1,000 people interested in the job we're trying to fill. Maybe 150 of them we take a serious look at you phone interview and you zoom interview and all that. And then when you get down to the very best of the best, which is not many for a search, mm -hmm. uh, you, we give a long format face-to-face -face interview. Mm -hmm. It's pretty detailed. We track it. We do a very similar pattern for every one of them. When, when we were in the pandemic shutdown, we realized we've now done 30,000 of these interviews. Holy crap. So that's a lot. Yeah. And, and we've tracked them all. We, we kind of I'd say that my team is OCD, but they'd get mad. They'd say, no, it's CDO because that's alphabetical. And, uh, you know, uh, they, we, we said, all right, 30,000 face to face interviews. These are the top talent we've ever encountered. Could we identify the best of those 30,000? And, and we mm -hmm. were able to like who got the job, who excelled and got promoted, who stayed like who is this special unicorn of a person? Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we identified them and then we said, do they have anything in common? Mm -hmm. And the answer was yes. Ah. And it was not the things I expected. Really? Yeah. Wow. No, not at okay. all. I, I, I thought IQ over 150. Nope. Nope. I thought six feet tall with great hair and bright teeth. Nope. Ah. Not that. Uh, all went to Ivy League schools or highly networked business societies or nope, 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 nope. None of those normal, wow. not what I would have presumed, right? So yeah. what were these things? Hey, can I, I take a guess? Yeah. Bribery. <laughs> did I win? You didn't check that one. That's probably <laughs> a good one to <laughs> Bribery. That's what it was. <laughs> hey, tell the HR guy, Here, here's a hundred bucks, man. Let's go. That's funny. Uh, I'm not now, sure that works. What we realized was, they all behaved in similar ways. They all had common habits. We narrowed it down to the 12 top habits that they shared. Ah. And, and even more interesting, it's habits that are really common among the best of the best and super uh -huh. uncommon among normal, regular rank and file population. And, and uh, so now uh, it, the quick way of answering this is for 15 years, Top organizations have hired me to find their next unicorn. Hmm. Well, now I know how to teach you to become one. And that's ah. that's pretty fun. So we're back to that. How do you what makes these people that you see within five minutes who they are? Well, now we know I think we have a bit of the code for how you become that person. There so I'm go. hoping it helps a lot of people. There you go. And we should plug uh, John C. Maxwell. Uh, we were talking before the show. He's one of my favorite uh, authors on leadership. Uh, wrote the forward for your book, too, as well. So That's right. Uh, John's been a mentor to me for a long, long time and was kind to take time to contribute. 
There you go. Uh, so give us a little bit of background, your hero's journey. How did you get into the field you got into? You know, oh. we don't have to start back at the Civil War when your family first came yeah. here, but, yeah, you know, yeah, what's yeah. your origin story, <laughs> kind of your journey? It's a weird story, man. I don't know that you want the answer to this. Well, uh, I mean, keep it short, man. Yeah. So, well, now <laughs> I, I, you mentioned it briefly, but I'm uh, in recovery. I'm a I'm a recovering preacher. So I, oh. go, I go a long ramble sometimes. I'll, I'll shorten it up. Uh, I served in at a very young age, um, one of the largest Presbyterian churches in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, boy, I was in way over my head. Um, I was 31. And I thought, you, you know, you know, the only thing I had going for me at 31, I knew everything. That was awesome. Uh, <laughs> Most people do that in their teens. So you're a late I, bloomer. And I changed things a little too fast. It was a great church, great people. I, I uh, was a little too entrepreneurial, but they, but they were kind and patient. Uh, and then went through a divorce, oh. which I would not recommend. Not a super yeah, fun not, thing. Um, not, yeah. And it wasn't, you know, oh, poor me. There was fault all over the place. But uh, sure. nothing the tabloids would have liked, but it was what it was. Went to work. I found myself a single dad with four kids and uh, in no shape to be guiding someone spiritually at the moment. I needed to do some work on myself, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, went to work in an oil and gas company, a, a rather large one. I live here in mm -hmm. Houston, and uh, oh, we yeah. had several of those. So uh, it, it was a Fortune 200 company, and they, they put me in a management rotation program, and they started me in HR, figuring, oh, you know, people will start there, right? Mm -hmm. So while I was there, the CEO said, uh, I've been here nine years as CEO, which I didn't know then, but now know that's a lifetime for a yeah, Fortune 200 yeah. CEO. That's mm -hmm. way longer than the average. Yeah. So he'd done a great job mm -hmm. and said, it's time to find my successor. I'm like, cool. How do they do that? And they hired this thing called an executive search firm. Mm -hmm. I had never in my life heard of such a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was the pastor at First Presbyterian Houston. It's where Sam and you thought you knew everything. Sam Houston went to church at our church. Like, <laughs> okay, that is back toward the Civil War. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the church is healthy and lovely, and they took three years to find me. Really? Wow. I was there six years. I left, and there was a three-year gap before the next guy. Wow. Twelve years, six with a leader, six looking for a leader. Wow. So I'm, I'm back in my oil and gas, and, uh, okay, we need to f hire an exec search firm. Ninety days later, they had their next guy. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Wow. You know, oil and gas, 90 days. And for much of the population that doesn't live in Houston, is there a more evil empire than, you know, the oil and gas? Ooh, right. Uh, 90 days for a new CEO, Fortune 200. Amazing church, doing good, been around forever. 12 years, half the time looking and half the time. with That doesn't add up at all. Yeah. And so I, uh, I said, I wonder, I mean, I've got all this training, I mm -hmm. undergrad at Wake Forest and a seminary at Princeton, uh, that maybe there's a better use for my training than this oil and gas thing. And I went home and I thought, you know, why does the business world have a better solution than the church for this? You know, mm -hmm. and I went home and, uh, it's cause Adrian, God wants it that way. <laughs> and Adrian, uh, Adrian and I had gotten married just a few months before. Uh -huh. And so we blended our families with six kids Oh, new Brady house. Bunch. Brady know, Bunch right? time. Right. Yeah. And uh, new house. And I said, you know what, babe? I think, I think I'm supposed to uh, quit my job and start uh, something new for churches. And, and she looked at me and she said, that's because churches love new ideas, right? Was that, was that being facetious? Just a little bit. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Churches I mean, and they new do have ideas. A year old book. No, 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 no. Churches and new ideas just don't get along very well. So, yeah. uh, and Anna, she, she should have said, "Go back to work. I love your visions and your dreams, but we got to feed yeah. these people." Yeah, I thought she was going to say, "How do I find an annulment?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, you she, want to switch she, jobs? She, <laughs> she should get the credit. Oh, and the kicker is, it was the fall of two thousand eight, which was oh. a brilliant time to quit your job. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. But she said, hey, let's give it a run. And it started with, uh, let's see if we can help churches find their pastor. And now it's turned into uh, any kind of values-based organization that's, that's driven by their values and their culture. Mm -hmm. And they want help finding not just talent, 
but talent mm -hmm. that matches their values and their culture. So uh, the book before this one was one on culture. We did a massive study and research project. So oh, wow. we get hired for like, how do you find the tissue match? The, the why behind our what? To use that Simon Sinek kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Like, can you find us someone with the same why? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that, that has led us to be in this little uh, very unique offering there's not another search firm out there like this and and we've been fortunate and had some clients that love telling other friends about us and uh, it's just kind of uh, organically grown way more than i ever thought it would there you go now you used the term tissue search tissue was, match tissue match yeah that was it uh tell us what that is i think i know what it is but tell us what yeah yeah is. yeah that's a great question i you know i tried to think of a good elevator pitch for why hire a search firm instead of just find somebody on my own, right? Mm -hmm. We live here in Houston. Uh, I live about two miles from the medical center. It's the largest gathering of doctors in the world. Mm -hmm. okay? And then we, like my little neighborhood is just specialist after specialist after specialist. Little Mercedes like, Benz's, yeah. It, well, that too, but uh, <laughs> they're just wicked smart. So I, I thought, you know, when somebody needs a search for a new CEO or a new senior leader, it's really like a heart transplant. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you take it, you want to find someone outside the body or the company to come inside the body and run the major system of the place. Or mm -hmm. maybe it's a kidney transplant if it's not a CEO. Right. It, it, mm -hmm. But it's an organ transplant. So I asked a couple of doctors, I was like, hey, I, I like this image and this metaphor. What separates the best transplant docs from the rest? And they're like, all of them were like, you would think is developing a donor list, finding people who, you know, that's not it. The best transplant doctors are the ones that get the tissue match right. Huh. Because because you can put a healthy heart into a healthy body, and if they don't match, there's rejection, and, and everybody has a bad ending. And we've all seen that in organizations that hire a, a CEO or a new leader, and they look great on paper, and they're healthy, and they're strong, but they don't fit the why of that organization, and it blows up everywhere, and... Uh, well, wow, that's more expensive than not doing anything. That's very true. That's very true. Uh, so this makes sense. Uh, the tissue, the 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 body of the organization. I love this concept. I, I never really thought of it that way. But you know, the one thing we learned uh, the hard way with all of my companies back in the day was putting the time in to hire, and and it, it it takes extra time. It's you know you can't fill the position right away. But taking that extra time to hire. And find the right people is everything because Absolutely. otherwise you can end up with just a nightmare on your hands of just the worst freaking people that you regret, that cause you problems, that you, there's legal issues with and everything else. And then, so, and then, you, and then you wait too long to fire them. Yeah, exactly. No, number one mistake I've seen in all the years I've been working with people and HR solutions and exec search. Number one mistake. People hire too quickly and they fire too slowly. Yeah. And the nice way of saying it is, hey, let's do long hellos and short goodbyes. <laughs> that's on my dating. That's on my Tinder dating profile. So there you go. Um, I think I was going to use the joke. How can I use that to uh, be on my Tinder check mark? So look, you have basically uh, where you've outlined in the book 12 habits that have the best in common towards building uh, authenticity, responsiveness, agility, and different things. Let's tease out some of these uh, habits sure. that you have inside the book. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, you think, well, what are these habits? Do I have to learn like the Pythagorean theorem? Do I have to learn, you know, <laughs> brain surgery? What? It, no. Hey, here's one that people are going to say, well, that doesn't make sense. That's just stupid. Get back to people. Ah, responsiveness. It's ah. so easy, Chris, to be the best at what you do if you just get back to people. Because we've studied and found that nearly everyone puts off getting back to people. And, mm -hmm. and I remember a uh, long time ago when I was a super young pastor and we were looking for a new location and I was riding around with my board chair and he said, I think we could probably get that YMCA. I know the board chair of the YMCA and call him, tell him, you know, here's his number. I'm like, cool. And we were standing in my office and he's like, when are you going to call him? I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, I'm like, you gave me the number two minutes. Ago. He said, well, what else have you got to do? I'll sit here and wait. I don't care. Call him. I'm like, 
huh? And he said, listen, the first chance you get is almost always the best chance. Oh, it's like when you're sitting at a busy intersection and right when you pull up, mm-hmm. there's a little way to pull out and then you wait and then it's 15 minutes before you can yeah, turn I out do again. all the time. Yeah. And then you kick yourself the whole time. You're like, what Things with responsiveness. Me? People don't mm-hmm. get back. Like, for instance, I don't know if you know this term inbound marketing. Yeah. Yeah. So like HubSpot, Infusionsoft, these companies where it's basically, if you don't know the term, it's ba- if you're on a website and it's like, would you like more information or someone to contact you, fill out this form. Mm-hmm. You fill out the form, they get back to you. Right. Mm-hmm. So uh, we, we were one of the very first uh, early adopters for HubSpot years ago. In fact, the founder and CEO was one of the guys who was an endorser of the book. And uh, they asked the question, you know, the point of a sales call is not to close the sale. That whole always be closing thing is mm-hmm. over. The point mm-hmm. of a sales call is to get the next sales call to keep the conversation moving toward closing. And it'll close when it needs to close. Right. Mm-hmm. Especially we're doing kind of consultative sales, not transactional buy it right now. And if you order now, I'll throw in a salad shooter. And like, that's not our, <laughs> that's not our deal. It's you know, different it's, than hiring people. Yeah. It's, a, it's a higher ticket item. So, although so, I uh, note to self, uh, offer HR people that are trying, trying to hire me uh, a free salad shooter if they do hire me. That's right. That's, a, that's right. Put that right on the resume there. So, so HubSpot asked the question, um, listen, how does time response time correlate to the likelihood of another call? In other words, Mm -hmm. if you respond in this amount of time, how likely is it you're going to get the next conversation? So the, the uh, study that was done revealed if you get, if somebody fills out a form, please contact me and you respond to them personally, not AI, but like something like, if it's somebody that's in New York and you're like, well, I hope you weren't at MetLife last night. That was kind of a bummer, even though you want, <laughs> right? Like that, <laughs> something yeah. personal and immediate within 60 seconds, you will get a 98% chance of talking to them again. Okay. Ah. You wait 20 minutes from when they mm. fill out the form. It drops to 60%. Mm. 20 minutes. You've lost so much. If you wait more than 24 hours, according to the study, Mm -hmm. you have Mm -hmm. a less than 1% chance of ever talking to that person again. Holy crap. So then the question. I should do this with all my exes. So so (laughs) then what what is the average response time of people that have inbound marketing and use it? Average response time, 42 hours. Oh, wow. So like this is not hard. If you just get back to people within a minute. That's really all you have to do. We did it in the early days of our company because I had six kids and a wife that needed to be fed. And if you mm-hmm. reached out to me and said, could we talk? I'm like, how's now? <laughs> but I kept getting uh, uh, comments over and over from people like, we couldn't believe how quickly you got back to us. Yeah, It's simple habits like that. And there you would you think. Like we looked all across industries. We looked on, I, I didn't look at Tinder, but we looked on dating <laughs> sites. Like what's the, what's the average response time to people when, when it's, you're talking about people that are looking for love, right? <laughs> they are all the wrong places. Yeah. They don't respond quickly at all. Mm-hmm. And, and what we found the unicorns, the people who are like, that's the guy I want on my team. They're maniacal about getting back to people quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I've even had people say to me over the years of business and stuff, you know, how can you get back to me so quickly? Or they, they'll send me an email and I'll reply. And nine times out of 10, they kind of got the luck of the draw where they sent me an email where I'm just between something, you know, and, and they're like, is this an autoresponder? And I'm like, no, this is me. You just caught me at the yep. most opportune moment. If you know, if I, if you email me during a podcast, I'm not going to answer, but you just caught me right right the smack dab moment and i learned a long time ago i studied uh, uh i think it was in the harvard business review but they interviewed one of the early successful vice presidents for some of apple and he talked about how he handled uh his mail and this is the old days of everything was mail and there wasn't email back then but you know emails and calls and everything and he's like you know i have a process and so uh, someone edits the mail for me to see, you know, get rid of the junk mail. And then they hand me the mail and, and, or any sort of task list or demand for task list. He goes, I don't put it off. I look at it and I read it and I make a decision. He goes, cause the dumbest thing you can do is waste your time by going, I'll get back to 
that. He's like, sometimes, you know, there's things you get back to. But he goes, I don't, I don't, I, once I touch a piece of mail, I decide whether, you know, I'm replying to her, keeping her, whatever it is, and moving on. I, he goes, otherwise you're doubling up your time. That's right. And so that's kind of the process I use. And people will be like, man, you're really fast. And I'm like, yeah, we got to get this shit out, man. Uh, we do the same thing with a podcast you know we have we post- my wife uh my wife mm-hmm. quotes a rule when it comes to stuff around the house mail that kind of thing uh it's an old rule i don't know if it's oprah or somebody like uh otio only touch it once exactly that's the concept yeah only touch it once and and the the unicorns find a way to triage in their mind is this something that needs immediate attention or not because mm-hmm. if somebody does reach out to you you're in a world where you're going to grab your phone, you're going to check all the different social platforms and the LinkedIn's and the emails and the texts and all. And if it, if, if you happen to be on reaching out, mm-hmm. if I reach right back to you, well, you're still on. Yeah. Right? Then the minute it goes down for dinner or whatever podcast or thing you're doing is to, so it's so easy to stand out. I, I've told, so we have seven kids now and uh, I've told every one of them as they've asked, gotten older and asked for career advice, what should I do? What should I, do? I said, listen, I don't care. Well, I do care. But yeah. It doesn't matter what you do. Here's the success formula. Mm-hmm. Do what you say you're going to do mm-hmm. when you say you're going to do it at the price that you promised. And you will be in the top 5% of your industry. And I yeah. don't think that's dog catching or running a country. Yeah. What's the old lines? 95% of success is showing up and stuff like people just don't get how something like that how, how, it's you simple know, habits Chris. basics simple habits it's just mm-hmm. not rocket science there you go so in your book you identify 12 skills i'm going to run through them here real quick the fast the authentic the agile the solver the anticipator the prepared the self-aware the curious the connected the likable the productive the purpose-driven the good the bad the ugly wait those three aren't on there that was last three that's a movie uh so uh so those 12 that you have there uh do we want to tease some of these out a little bit yeah so we talked about the the fast the responsive Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. you know the other thing that i found uh all 12 of them are super easy to implement but it's kind of like I don't know. Have you ever had a friend who says they're going to start running and they spend stupid money on a treadmill and all it does is gather dust? That's yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about a friend. I'm talking about a friend. Yeah, right? yeah. Right. So it, it's, you know, it's just not that hard. You just have to do it. And mm-hmm. uh, one of the habits that, that I have found um, is super true among the unicorns or super talented is they're curious. Oh. And that means a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, one, one thing it means is, I, you know, when I don't do many searches anymore, I've got a great team here, a whole lot of full-time folks that do that and they're better at it than I am. Mm-hmm. Every now and then I need to get involved because, oh, your name's on the door kind of thing, right? Yeah, so, a uh, damn door thing. I know, right? The, the SEO guys, <laughs> back to them. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if I'm involved, all the baseline stuff's already been done and I'm spending time with you, Chris, you're interviewing for something. And I'm like, here's what, here's how we're going to say, hey, Chris, listen, man, I don't do many searches anymore and you don't need to tell me your life story again. I, what I would, what I think might be the best use of our time, because I know the client, is to let you ask me questions that you might not want to ask your future employer. You're not going to bother me. Just ask me what you want to ask me. Do you know how much I learn from what <laughs> questions you ask me? Wow. I never thought about that. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I learn way, way more, mm-hmm. you know, well, what's the pay? Well, that's a stupid question to lead with. I mean, you got yeah, yeah. to get there sooner or later. Yeah. What are the benefits? You know, yeah. uh, well, what's I the noticed that like? their I noticed that their mission is to provide clean water for people in Africa and they've drilled this many wells. How are they going to decide where to drill next? And what's the decision making behind that? Like, Oh, oh. Yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. You did homework. Yeah. Or, you know, man, this, this Chris Voss show that you're, you know, I want to go to work for them. It's hockey stick growth. It's like this. And uh, I'm just curious, why is it growing? And why should I believe it's going to continue to grow? It's because we have an OnlyFans channel on the side. No, we don't. <laughs> That's a joke, people. <laughs> or, you know, like, tell me about Chris. I want to know what it's like to work for him. What's what, 
what he's an makes asshole. Him, well, what makes him happy and do backflips, <laughs> and what makes him just, you know, run? <sighs> so there's a curiousness, and it, and you know, I noticed this first when I was uh, running a pretty cool organization that I, I I ended up in regular interaction with absolute world beaters. Uh, you know, they were just the captains of whatever industry they were in. Mm-hmm. And the, I noticed a correlation. The more successful a person was, the harder it was for me to get them to talk about themselves. Mm. I mean, they almost always wanted to talk about me or they were asking mm-hmm. me questions. One example of from a long time ago, we, you know, our, this first Presbyterian church I was in, um, I don't know if you remember the name Lloyd Benson. Sounds familiar. So he he was the on the ticket as vice president, oh, uh, yeah. running against Bush and Quayle. So that's a long time oh, ago. Okay, yeah. yeah. He's the one that looked at Quayle and said, "I knew Jack Kennedy. You're no ah, Jack Kennedy." That's who that was. What a great line. Yeah. So so when he died, I had to do the funeral. Oh. Um, <laughs> Miss Benson calls me and says, "Do you mind if we have someone do a eulogy before you speak?" I'm like. Sure, Miss Benson, whatever you need. She said, okay, well, President Clinton's going to do that. I'm like, I just drew the shortest straw in public speaking possible. <laughs> <laughs> so long story short, there was going to be a burial first, and the Senate sent a plane with everybody you can imagine. I mean, it was, oh, wow. a, big old, it was a big old deal. And wow. we were going to have this outdoor thing at the cemetery before the funeral. And wow. then it rained cats and dogs. Well, oh, God. so – they're not going to, they had to revamp. And the net net was president Clinton and I ended up in my office for about two hours, just one-on-one. Yeah. I tried to get that man to talk about himself. He wouldn't do it. Oh, do you offer you any cigars? No, he, he asked me questions. Oh, I see on your desk, a brochure, you're leading a trip to Turkey and uh, Greece. Mm. You should call my friend, the guy who runs the Eastern Orthodox Church, basically the Pope of the Eastern world. And I'm like, well, Mr. President, I'll just, you know, I'll just, uh, you know, get on the Internet and try and figure sure, out yeah. everything. And he said, no, 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 no. I'm going to connect you. Wow. And then, so I tried to flip it. I'm like, he's wearing this little yarn bracelet. And I'm like, where did you get the yarn bracelet? He's like, oh, these kids in Bolivia gave it to me. They make it. They're doing it. I said, oh, oh. you know what? We do mission work there. He's like. You need to get in touch with the whatever consulate or ambassador. Like knows or everybody. Same, same thing. I'll just look. No, 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 no. I'll take care of it. And he asked me two more things and kept asking about me. Mm-hmm. Right. And we spent two hours together. I knew nothing about him, but man, it felt like I was the only person in the room. I'm like, yeah. no matter what your political platform, if you spend time with that guy one-on-one, you're like, okay, I get why you won. Like, Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I, I'm always curious about people too, because I'm sick of me. I mean, that's where I'm at. That's why I do the podcast, and I love mm-hmm. it, talking to people, asking mm-hmm. questions. Because I'm more interested in them and their journey. Like I, I, I have 55 years with me, but that's interesting. He was like that. And if you if you want to know uh, more about him, he was like president for eight years. He was reelected twice. Back I, when we were younger. <laughs> <laughs> I remember much younger. Huh? Man, the energy I used to have back then. Um, the uh, so yeah, that's interesting that, that people have that thing. Um, you but, know, but Chris, it's not common. Most people aren't really? curious. They don't ask I questions. Way, yeah. Just ask questions. Yeah, they don't care. Is it they don't care? They're apathetic, or maybe they're just narcissistic and they love themselves too much. Maybe, maybe all of the above. I don't know the why behind that, but I do know <laughs> the best of the best are curious and uh, they ask questions. No. Uh. But oh. those are the people you want for business and innovation because when they Absolutely. come in, they're going to ask questions. They're going to be like, why do we do it this way? And everyone Absolutely. goes, to, well, yeah, we do it this way. And you're like, well, this is stupid. We should do something better. Yeah. So, several of these habits are kind of cousins. You know, they, they, mm-hmm. they cluster around each other. And one around curiosity, the other one is the agile. And that's uh-huh. the person that's always. You mean agile? Yeah. One of the two. <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, you, you know, Here's the thing. So years ago, when our seventh, who's 13 now, she's probably, I don't know, three or four, I'd gotten to the age, we're pretty similar age, and uh, I'd gotten to the age where I do try and run regularly or jog, and uh, I needed to stretch because I was starting to get injured. Yeah. You know? So the stretching was harder than the run. I mean, mm-hmm. like touching the toes was 
worse than six miles. I couldn't. And I was in my uh, den stretching after a long run. And the little one comes in, sees me just dying to try and touch my toes. She she walks up next to me, sits down on the floor, ties herself in a human pretzel as only little kids can. Right. Yeah. Stands up and looks at me and laughs and leaves the room. And I'm like, that's when you put them up for adoption or send them to military. Well, you right know there. what I did do? I, I thought to myself, you know what, William? Every day you're alive, you get less flexible. Yeah. Ah, I see the, I see what you're up to there. See that? Yeah. It's true of organizations. They calcify with time. It's true of people. Yeah. And, and, and my liver. Just, a, it's a biological fact. So when you run into somebody who's committed to stretching themselves – and mm -hmm. committed to agility, mm -hmm. man, that's a special person. There you and go. It, I it, love it comes it. out, you know, it, think about the people who really excelled during the shutdown of the pandemic. It's the ones who really did learn how to pivot and do something different. Mm -hmm. Even no matter what your job was, you had other duties as necessary come up. The people that rose to the top are the ones like, seize the moment. We've never done this before. Let's, uh, hey, jump out of the plane and build the parachute on the way down. Let's there do it. Yeah. So, yeah. That's how I like doing it. Wait. Well, you know what? It's how it's going to be. With the That's rise true. Of, rise of AI over the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. it, if you aren't agile, you're dead. Yeah. It's moving way, way faster. We were talking about this this week with some different authors that we're on. And you're right. Uh, it's it's moving whipping fast. Like even as far as I'm used to moving fast, I'm just like, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's a AI thing, man. It's uh, going. Yeah. Well, and the cool thing about the 12 habits in the unicorn mm -hmm. is uh, there aren't many of them that AI can do. Oh. A lot of them are the soft skills, the human skills, which mm. I think are going to become the premium over the next uh, decade as AI really. I mean, the history of work is we invent something cool to make things efficient. It replaces human jobs and we got to go find a new way to use humans. It's just think to the industrial revolution. This is not a new song sheet, right? Mm -hmm. But the people that will do really well in the next 10 to 12 years are people who will focus on things like the 12 habits, the soft skills of humans, the things that a computer cannot do. And, mm. and I'm hopeful that that'll help uh, people that are out there right now wondering, is my job going to be around in five years? Well, yeah. study these things, and I think you'll find it will be there. Definitely. I mean, you're, you're preparing yourself to be the best machine that you possibly can. One, uh, number seven, is the self-aware uh, self-awareness, self-actualization, and, and self-accountability, I imagine, would fall into that chapter. Uh, this is really important because uh, being a leader, being you know, we, we talked to somebody this week or last week about how a lot of leaders that they pull aren't self-aware, and that's where their weakness is. Absolutely. The, you know, narcissism is a spectrum. And and we're, well, it is. It. I mean, <laughs> tell honestly, me about it. <laughs> well, you know, you know this. You've interviewed thousands of entrepreneurs, and you are one. Uh, yeah. A narcissist is someone who really thinks they can bend reality to their will. That's true. And people who start a company have to have a little bit of that, mm -hmm. or or they'll just listen to the world, and the world will tell them that's dumb. Don't do that. Okay, I won't try something. No, they're just believers in what they're doing. I, I've I've lived that starting our company, but. Yeah. Within that spectrum, there are very few people who can develop enough self-awareness to know how that is going to impact the crowd around them. The people who are self-aware separate themselves. Like, like you ever do a job interview, uh, you're interviewing for a job, and they say, so tell me about yourself. I hate that question. Yeah, it's pretty open-ended. Like, so, where do you want me to start? Prison My time mom and or... my dad felt really <laughs> like they really loved each other a lot. And then... <laughs> Prom night. <laughs> right. Back so, to Chevy. Well, here's, here's how a unicorn answers that. Oh, Chris, I'm interviewing for work with you. I, I, I'll tell you about myself. Look, I was studying your company, and I've seen you just grown crazy. You were mm -hmm. on the front end. You're podcasting back in 2008, 2009. I mean, like that's at the beginning of everything. You guys probably had to figure it out as you go. You know what? <laughs> I, I am on the Enneagram. I'm a seven. You know, on the Strengths Finder, I'm an innovator, right? Mm -hmm. I do well in situations where we don't really know what we're going to do next, but we're growing mm -hmm. fast and we got to do it fast. And I can tell you, because in my last job, they had me start a marketing department. I didn't have any tools. 
I got him on the HubSpot. I got him onto this. We saw four oh. percent growth over the first year. Now, you see what happened there? Yeah, I do. I'm I showing do. you self awareness, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to say, and that's Chris. Why I'm super excited about the chance to interview with you because I think the way I'm wired matches the kind of person you need. Yeah, and you, you and you're curious too. You you did the research and, and stuff. Right. You're not just like. Uh, hey, when do I get paid? And uh, when's my first vacation day? Because exactly uh, right. I used to exactly love people right. and I'd hire them. We and, and, and you can, you can take it a step further. And you can say, mm -hmm. you know what, Chris? If you're interviewing me to be like your controller or your compliance officer and teach you how to follow rules, and it, that's just not me. Yeah, I'm not. I I would get fired from that really fast. And what you've done there is you prevented the question that nobody knows how to answer, and that is. Tell me about your greatest weakness. Mm. Well, I never ask for a raise. I work too many hours. You know, no, there's, you've just shown self-awareness. I know where I'm most productive. I can see it in what I've done in the past. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm going to fit your company because what you're doing is similar to my wiring. Yeah. I thought of a good question I can ask when I'm hiring people too. Tell me about the times you're in prison. <laughs> i got some great stories about some people that tried to dodge around that with me they'd done some prison time and they left like a three-year hole in their in their timelines yeah. yeah and and they're and you're like so dumb like dude when i was 20 i knew to match that shit up uh and uh and then uh, my favorite is when they go what what are the dates don't match and i go i don't know it's your resume and i'm like it says you're working for xyz company and they go, no, I was during that time I was working for that company. And and they'll literally ask for the resume back. And I go, I'm not giving it to you back. This is your damn resume. You should know it's on it. So <laughs> how wh what have we invented here, buddy? Which part is the lie? Which is the truth? And then, right. and then they're all kerfuffled. And that's when you go, well, you know, whatever. But uh, yeah, there's that. Um, so uh, there's a lot of great stuff in here. I love the 12 uh, techniques, the 12 tips that people can use um the curious the connected the likable these are all these are all really great skills the purpose driven uh per person is the 12th as, as to uh driving your own purpose i think that's really good tell us a little bit about that if you would yeah so so i'm sure your listeners have uh heard the simon sinek talk the why behind the what know the why something like ah. that mm -hmm. you know it it's got eight bajillion views mm -hmm. um you know the the number one selling nonfiction book in history other than the bible is a book called the Pur uh, the purpose driven life oh. and it's like understanding what you're wired to do and what your why your thing that makes you do crazy stuff because you've got to get that task done the the unicorns know their why they know that they want to, you know, whatever it is, end world hunger. They want to make enough money to give to their great grandchildren. They want to, it doesn't have to be a giant purpose. It just needs to be a North Star that guides everything that they do. And, and the people who are clear on that are very rare, but it's not super hard to be one of those people. Yeah. Yeah. The people that have a purpose in life, they know what they're doing. They're not just aimless going. Ass. I mean, I always did what I did because of uh, vodka, but um, I suppose that was a purpose in some sort of way for 20 years. So there was that. Uh, but, you know, um, my, vodka and money and, and chicks. I don't know. Whatever. Um, so there you go. Uh, I love the uh, concept behind this. And then I can be a unicorn. No, do I get a horn if I become a unicorn and fulfill no, I, the. I, uh, I probably ought to things? develop something like that. Yeah, you should. Oh. I want one you for know, my we, desk. Eh? You know what we did develop that's super helpful and, and it's launching today as well is a software tool where you mm -hmm. can. So we, we identified the 12 things with the unicorns and then we surveyed a quarter million people about those 12, giving a self assessment. And then we, so we both you know, hired a bunch of applied math and council hired counselors. And how do we build this thing out where you, why don't you take this little inventory and it'll show you how you match up against the general uh, uh, norm and how you match up against the best of the best. Mm -hmm. And what are your top three habits of the 12 and what are your bottom three? So that you, you can have a coaching plan for how you can get better. What should I work on first? Where should I yeah. go first? Yeah. So we're, we're super excited about that. I took the test and it said I'm a donkey. So, 
<laughs> not even a horse. So I got some work to do. <laughs> said you said you're a dumb mule. And I'm like, well, I mean, you don't have to be rude about it. But there you go. Everybody likes donkey. And don't you, well, yeah, and the shack donkey. thing, but uh, I don't know. You know, I don't know. Whatever. I, I got nothing with the rest of that joke. Uh, so this has been really insightful, William, and it's been fun to have you on and uh, hear about your Brady Bunch family. Are you, are we going to keep adding to this? Uh, is no, no. Story? Well, if we do, it, it would be we're going to have to have a long conversation about how that happened. Yeah, that's uh, well, you know, you never know with these things. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's the story of a <laughs> little lady. I don't know how the hell it goes. You'd think I'd know that story. But uh, this is wonderful, and I'm glad you put out the book because we need better leaders. We need better leaders who are self-aware. They're self-accountable. Um, we need just need better leaders. Damn it. Maybe we can send this all to politicians to see if we can develop some, which is probably not ever going to work. Um, so there you go. Uh, William, thank you for coming on the show. Give us your .coms so we can find you yep. on the interwebs. Vanderblumen.com. That's all you need. Spell it however you want. You'll get there. There we go. That's so funny. Uh, folks, order it up wherever fine books are sold. Be the Unicorn, 12 Data-Driven Habits to Separate the Best Leaders from the Rest, November 14, 2023. It's out. They studied over 30,000 top leaders and discovered the best 12 habits. So if that's not good enough for you, what more do you want? Jesus, 30,000 leaders. That's awesome. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Foss. Watch for us on the big LinkedIn newsletter and Chris Foss one on the tickety talkity. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. We'll see you guys next time. And.